Hi, Karsten. Hi, like, how are you? I'm good. This is a good series of talks. It was good, good choice of talks. I'm glad to hear that you're enjoying them. That's oh, great. yeah, I am. That's excellent. And you've had a lot of trouble with, with you, all the old guys are dying and you're having to, to, to talk about a lot of people you didn't know. I'm yes. watching the department just fade away from what I what I knew. Who is dying, yeah. Mike? Oh, Charlie Summerfield died. Charlie Summerfield died? Yeah. When? Last uh, week, you'll have yeah. to ask Karsten. Yeah, last Friday. He passed away last Friday. Oh my god. He was he was in Floyd though, wasn't he? Yes, that's correct. Oh my god. Hi Juan, how are you? Hello, how are you? Good. I'm going away from you. Good to see you, Mike. Pardon me? What did you say? Good to see you. It's good to see you. If it only to see you. <laughs> so you're all set for presentation and for yeah, connections? Yeah, okay. so let me... Let me try sharing the screen and Can you see my screen? Yes. Sure. Excellent. Hi, Karsten. Hello. I um I owe you an email. I I, I had to uh, check on. I had to verify uh, the dates for this uh, Schultz lecture before I uh, responded. But I sure. I'm not ignoring it. Just wanted you to know. I had to verify. No no worries. When you get a chance, you can verify okay. it. Okay. All right. I I um I think the date has changed. That um uh, that the the nineteenth is open, but I just wanted to verify it. Okay. Sounds good. Hi, Karsten. Hi, Joan. How are you? Hi, how are you? Hi, Charlie. Hi, Juan. How are you? I'll mute now. Yeah, so we'll wait another couple of minutes. Okay.
that's a minute past the hour. Why don't we get started? Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this week's uh, Physics Club. It's a great pleasure to welcome back Johan Maldacena for the second Lee Page Price uh, lecture this uh, spring. Um, I hope many of you heard uh, the first one last week. But for those of uh, uh, who joined us this week, let me just give a brief um, yeah, introduction. Juan uh, received his PhD at Princeton in 1996, and uh, he has been a professor at uh, Princeton um, at the Institute for Advanced Study since uh, 2001. Since 2016, he is the Carl P. Feinberg Professor at the IAS, and today he will uh, talk to us about wormholes and entanglement. Welcome, Juan. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I Can you hear me? Yes. yes, yes, very good. Um, so please uh, ask questions during the talk and interrupt me uh, during the talk. That I, it would be great if, if you can ask them during the talk. Um, so I'll be, I'll be talking about uh, what, some curious space-time configurations. Um, and the outline is that I'll first talk about wormholes. First, we start with the so what I would call science fiction wormholes. Um, and where they can exist or not exist. Then we'll discuss some very simple wormholes that exist in general relativity um, that are non-traversable. And then we'll discuss uh, traversable wormhole solutions in general relativity plus suitable matter. And then we'll finally discuss a wormhole you could travel through. Um, and one of my main motivations is not only to talk about wormholes, but also uh, talk about their relation to entanglement and for that purpose, I'll remind you of some relationship between black holes and quantum systems. And then we'll discuss this connection between wormholes and entanglement. Okay, so uh, general relativity. So now Einstein realized that gravity could be described uh, by allowing uh, space time to be curved. And he derived Einstein's equations, which tell us, which relate the curvature of space time to the energy density of matter. One important property of Einstein's equations is that light rays are typically focused as they propagate on a curved space-time. Um, now, um, in, in many cases, the curvature, the deformation of space-time that we consider is relatively small, and its uh, topology is typically the same as that of Minkowski space. But the main purpose of this first part of the talk is to analyze spacetimes which with non-trivial spacetime topologies. Um, and first uh, we will see what is allowed and what is forbidden. And then we'll talk about this traversable or non-traversable wormholes. We'll discuss what the difference is. And then we'll go back to uh, black holes and entanglement. Now the idea of wormholes uh, goes a long way back. Um, the person who invented the name was Wheeler who drew this picture, which is hanging in the physics department here in Princeton. Um, so wormholes have been one of the staples of science fiction uh, stories, and they're usually used to travel fast, faster than the speed of light. So as a device that would allow you to travel faster than the speed of light, and sometimes also travel into the past. Um, so the, the configurations people have in mind uh, is something where we have some amb ambient uh, flat space or very large space. Um, and then uh, there are two little mouths that form a kind of space-time tunnel that connects these two points. And a key idea of the science fiction wormholes is that um, you, could, um, you could move go much faster through this uh, region than in the ambient space in such a way that if you enter here, uh, let's say you could enter here in one instant and come out, uh, let's say one second later here, uh, even though the black holes are separated by a distance, uh, which would be, I don't know, um, a light year. So this would allow you to travel faster than the speed of light. Um, so by what I'm going to define as a science fiction wormhole is something that would allow you to travel faster than the speed of light or to travel to the past. Um, I will always be talking about travel times. Uh, well, for now, I'm going to be talking about travel times as seen from someone who stays outside. So 
if you are an observer who stays outside, then you see someone going in through one mouth of this wormhole and coming out here, let's say uh, at an instant later, we will call that the instant, the travel time through the wormhole. And um, I'm going to call it a science fiction wormhole if, if that instant is shorter than this, this distance in the ambient space. Um, now this is uh, another depiction of uh, this wormhole geometries. Um, we could imagine uh, that that big space, let's say somehow folded in some external dimension that has no physical meaning. Um, and then we have some connection. And so we could go between these two points through this uh, relatively short wormhole or through the relatively long uh, amb ambient space uh, distance between the two wormholes, wormhole, wormhole mouths. So these are the types of configurations we are going to be discussing now. And for simplicity, for now, we are going to consider them to be time independent. So imagine this as a configuration of space. And then in addition, we have time. Um, now, these type of wormholes are problematic and because they violate the principle that signals cannot propagate faster than light in the ambient space. Um, and so we would have a violation of the principle on which special relativity rests. I mean, we could have mic tiny microscopic wormholes that would violate this principle. And so it calls into question whether the principle is really valid or not. And this is really a very basic principle of our current physics framework. So all of our theories of particle physics are based on this principle of special relativity. Um, and it's also the principle that led to general relativity itself. So if somehow general relativity allowed you to violate the principle that it was uh, based on, it would be a funny situation. Um, and furthermore, uh, traveling faster than light combined with special relativity can lead you to travel, travel into the past with associated paradoxes. Now, something that is true is that as mathematical geometries, they are well-defined in the sense that they are possible geometries for space or for space-time. Uh, there is nothing wrong with them from just purely the mathematical point of view. However, uh, in and general relativity is more than just geometry. Uh, the geometry should obey Einstein's equations. And Einstein's equations, as we saw, say that curvature should be equal to energy density. And so you might think, OK, it's, this is no problem, because we can always engineer the right energy density to give that uh, curvature that the given spacetime has. So this might lead you to think that you could build any spacetime that you, any geometry that you like. However, uh, energy is positive uh, classically. So in particular, the null-null components of the energy. So this is basically the energy density minus the momentum density. So that quantity is positive. And this results uh, in the condition that gravity always focuses light rays. And this is true even uh, if we have, let's say, a potential, that, a scalar potential that is negative or, or a dark energy term that is negative. Uh, even the, even in those circumstances, we uh, this particular component of the stress tensor is positive. So this type of energy um, is positive. Uh, what happens with the cosmological constant is that it does not contribute to t plus plus. Mm. Now this idea that uh, matter focuses light is central to one of uh, Penrose's most famous results, which is that uh, black holes can form and that they contain a singularity. Um, now, it turns out that traversable wormholes need some defocusing. And the reason is relatively simple to understand. So imagine a bunch of some light rays that are coming into uh, the mouth of the wormhole. So they're initially coming together, and then they go through the wormhole, and then they go out away from each other again. So they were initially coming together, focusing, and then they uh, go out uh, and getting further and further away from each other. And so there was a net uh, defocusing uh, situation through the wormhole. That means that necessarily in this wormhole should have some negative uh, T plus plus. So some negative energy density should exist in this wormhole um, in order for this to be a possible geometry. I mean, th this is just uh, a fact of what the Ricci, the Ricci tensor is here is, 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 is such because light rays defocus the Ricci tensor has some uh, negative terms, uh, negative co negative components, and the uh, therefore the energy should be negative. So there should be negative null components of the energy. 
Um, now, this seems to be a happy resolution of the problem. So Einstein's equations do not allow those science fiction wormholes because the energy of matter is always positive. Um, and this also emphasizes the fact that Einstein theory is more than geometry. The geometry is constrained by the equations. And these constraints depend on the detailed properties of matter. And, and so it's a del delicate dance between uh, geometry and matter. And the whole theory um, is consistent without allowing these uh, funny situations. Um, now, however, in quantum mechanics, we know that the energy can be negative. And so in particular, there are so-called Casimir forces. Uh, sometimes the energy generated by quantum fields in the vacuum can be negative. Um, there is uh, energy generated by Van der Waals forces are analogous to Casimir energies. And that's what uh, allows these uh, little animals to stick to the glass and defy the force of gravity. Um, now, the question is whether this type of Casimir forces can allow wormholes. So is, would that now be possible once we include quantum effects? Now, it turns out that in quantum mechanics, we uh, expect that the following uh, energy condition should hold. It's called the, well, it, it's saying that a particular integral of T plus uh, plus should be positive. Um, so T plus plus can be locally negative in quantum quantum mechanics, um, quantum field theory, but this integral uh, has to be positive. Now, what is this integral? So this is an integral of T plus plus along a light ray. So we have some particular light ray, any light ray in the geometry. Well, actually not any light ray, but a light ray, which is so-called achronal. So achronal means that it is the fastest light ray that you can have in a given geometry. So that no points uh, on along the light ray can be joined by a curve, which is uh, time-like, which is purely time-like or sometimes called chronon. So that's where the, this word comes from. More intuitively, we should say that this is just simply the fastest way to go between uh, two faraway regions. And if uh, you consider such a light ray, then this integral should be uh, positive or zero. So that's the condition that is believed to um, hold in quantum mechanics. It, it is really a conjecture, so it hasn't been proven for arbitrary space times and arbitrary quantum field theory, um, but it's been proven in several, uh, in some circumstances, for example, for free field theories in somewhat general space times, and also uh, in flat space has been proven for general uh, interacting theories in some uh, recent papers. And um, and one of these proofs has an interesting connection, uses uh, some properties of quantum information theory to prove it. Um, now, this implies that uh, science fiction wormholes are still forbidden. And the reason is that, um, well, as explained in, this, in papers by these authors, um, if you consider these light, light rays that we were discussing, uh, the net uh, focusing effect of the whole geometry turns out to be uh, related to the integral of uh, T++ along this full light ray. So the light ray that goes through the wormhole. And these light rays are uh, the fastest light rays in this geometry if the wormhole allows you to go faster this way than through the ambient space. I mean, there is another light ray you could consider, which is one that stays outside. But that one arrives uh, later than this one that goes through the wormhole if this is one of these science fiction wormholes. And so this is the kind of light rays for which uh, the integral of T plus plus should be positive. And then this author show that if this integral is positive, then uh, this uh, cannot be solutions of uh, Einstein's equations. Okay. Um, so the conclusion uh, that I want to draw from this is that basic principles of special relativity and quantum mechanics imply uh, pos this positivity of energy, this particular form that we discussed. And together with general relativity, this forbid traversable wormholes violating the faster than light travel ban. So there is this. Um, now, it's not quite a rigorous theorem yet, but uh, it's uh, because of because the null energy, the, in, the acronal null energy condition has not been uh, fully proven. Um, but so it's a task for maybe someone in the audience to fully prove it. Um, but it's, it's likely that it will be proven. Now, these are very basic principles, and they do not depend on the specific properties of the particles we know. So, for example, if uh, we discover some dark matter particle, 
uh, we expect that the dark matter particle will not, not uh, well, will continue to obey these properties and will not lead you to um, to a construction which uh, gives you one of these science fiction wormholes. So in, in science fiction movies, they often uh, show the main character or some character in the movie that works out the equations and so on and suddenly discovers the way to create one of these wormholes. But I think this is an unrealistic feature because the theories we have of physics are baked in. We have this uh, principle of special relativity and we essentially have understood that it is not possible. And so it's likely that if you discover a way how to construct wormholes, maybe it comes from an experimental discovery. So they should have an experimentalist discovering something new uh, rather than a theorist deriving it from the formulas we already know. Um, now, um, I, I would like to comment uh, that there is an interesting link between uh, causality. This, this discussion we've been having provides an interesting link between causality and a certain positivity property of quantum matter. So this and so gravity and quantum mechanics are good partners. Um, so relativistic quantum field theory ensures that uh, gravity uh, does not violate or space-time does not violate the principles of special relativity and the principles on which it is uh, it is based. And uh, so it's one of these cases where the beast is saving the beauty as in the beauty and the beast. Um, so sometimes the beauty is the geometry, which is supposed to be more beautiful than the details of matter, the matter theory and quantum mechanics. Um, and it's one of these cases where uh, the quantum mechanics, interesting properties of quantum mechanical systems, uh, quantum, quantum field theory, um, save uh, the principles of general relativity. Now, sometimes uh, people invoke exotic matter. And by exotic matter, what they mean is uh, matter that can have negative null energy. And this is matter that is outside the framework of quantum field theory. So if you see a paper saying that they are going to construct uh, one of these uh, science fiction wormholes, what you would usually find is that uh, either they give no explicit realization of the matter they consider, or they consider matter which is outside the framework of uh, quantum field theory. An example of matter outside the framework is to consider uh, spinor fields that are bosons instead of fermions, for example. That's uh, one way you can um, well, you can get negative null energy. Um, but of course, uh, we think uh, from general principles of quantum field theory, especially the so-called spin statistic, statistics uh, principle uh, theorem, uh, that we uh, should not be considering uh, bosonic spinor fields. Uh, now, I should emphasize that the laws of physics, and in particular general relativity, does allow non-traversable wormholes. So the simplest of these, well, these are typically time-dependent wormholes. So let me discuss the simplest case. They arise in the simplest solution of general relativity, the first exact solution that was found in general relativity, the Schwarzschild solution. So for that, uh, we need to look at uh, the Schwarzschild solution. And it's useful to uh, represent the Schwarzschild solution using these so-called Penrose diagrams. Uh, these are diagrams where um, we represent the space-time geometry as a little map uh, here. Um, and as in ordinary maps, we rescale uh, the, full, the full geometry uh, when we do this mapping. And the mapping is done so that uh, the rescaling preserves angles. In particular, it preserves the directions of light rays, which are 45 degree lines uh, in this figure. And here we only draw the two, two of the dimensions. So the radial and time dimensions are drawn here. And on each point on this diagram, there is also a two-dimensional sphere. Um, now, this uh, part of the diagram uh, represents the exterior of a black hole. So this uh, black line here represents the asymptotic region, so the far away region in uh, flat uh, four-dimensional space. Um, these uh, lines here uh, represent the black hole horizon. Uh, so if you cross the horizon, then um, you will end up here at the singularity, so a region where space-time collapses, um, and you will die here at the singularity. Um, this, so Schwarzschild originally found uh, this, presented the solution in some coordinates that only cover this region, but eventually through the work of uh, several people, 
uh, it was understood that uh, the solution could be analytically extended and is really describing uh, two black holes. So there is a second exterior region, and these two exterior regions are, are joined. Um, they, the two exterior regions share a single interior, uh, a single future interior, and there's also some kind of past interior. Um, so this particular uh, time slice, so at some, the, the geometry is time dependent. So at some particular time, let's call that t equal to zero, um, the geometry of space, uh, just purely the spatial directions, looks like a three-dimensional space far away here, a three-dimensional flat space. And then uh, it's connected by a narrow neck uh, to another three-dimensional flat space. So that geometry is represented here. So we have the three-dimensional flat space far away connected by a narrow neck with another second three-dimensional flat space. So one comes here from the right side, the other one from the left side. And this point in the middle corresponds to the waist here, the most narrow region of this wormhole. Now, I should emphasize that this is a solution. Uh, this is a vacuum solution of Einstein's equations. There is no matter, uh, no exotic matter, and no matter at all. And uh, it represents these two exteriors sharing an interior. Now, the geometry is time dependent. dependent. So at equal to 0, we could imagine having this geometry. And then if we think about the slice at a later time, so further into the future, that slice, again, contains through two three-dimensional space, far, spaces far away. But the neck region is growing in length, so it becomes uh, longer. That's related to this uh, length becoming longer as we approach the singularity. And then, in addition, the uh, size of the waist or the size of the sphere that we haven't drawn in this diagram uh, becomes smaller and smaller. So you can think of this as a kind of bridge. It's called the Einstein-Rosen bridge. So Einstein and Rosen were the first to notice that the solution had these two regions. And this bridge exists that t equal to zero, and then it uh, gradually uh, sort of stretches and shrinks and, in, and collapses into a singularity. So it's a collapsing bridge. Now, if you try to go from the left, right, the right side to the left side, you would travel along a time-like or null direction. And so that would be, so the fastest you could go is following a light ray direction. So you would move here to the left and you will never manage to come out. You will reach a singularity, OK? Uh, so that's why it's called a non-traversable wormhole. So the bridge collapses before you can traverse it. And it's important that the bridge uh, sort of expands and uh, shrinks in this particular way in order for it to be non-traversable. Notice that even though it's non-traversable, it's just barely so. So any you could imagine that adding a little bit of matter, you could modify this geometry and make these wormholes now traversable. Okay. Now, um, as we just saw, uh, unless we, um, so if we just have ordinary matter on this geometry, it uh, will not be traversable. Now, here we had two uh, two black holes and two separate universes. So we have two separate R three directions, very far away. Um, but we could imagine this as an approximation to two black holes in the same universe. So we could have a very similar configuration. It's a, another possible solution, which has the two black holes are sitting in the same universe, but are separated by a very long distance so, um, so that we can neglect the influence of one black hole into another or, or take into, into account uh, perturbatively later. And, um, and so this geometry contains two black holes, again, sharing the interior. Okay. I should emphasize that if you have two black holes in our universe, they will not have this geometry. So the black holes that are produced in our universe are get produced from gravitational collapse of stars. And in the interior, they have matter, and they have uh, a different geometry with basically a single exterior. It doesn't have. However, this is some other uh, configuration that you could possibly consider. Now, what are we to make of these geometries? So one option is to ignore them, because uh, there is no simple formation mechanism. Um, as we said, uh, when we have collapsing black holes in nature, we don't produce this. Or another option is to try to understand, uh, to understand what they mean a bit better. And we'll come back to, to them later. Now, so those are very simple uh, non-traversable wormholes that we have in general relativity. 
Um, and now you can ask uh, whether traversable wormholes are possible. So these were non-traversable, non-traversable ones, we saw that they are possible. Um, are traversable ones possible? Well, we, we just had a long discussion saying that they are not possible if they allow you to travel faster than light, those uh, science fiction wormholes we discussed. Um, but uh, it turns out that the answer is yes, if the travel through the wormhole is longer than the travel time outside the wormhole. So there are solutions where uh, you roughly have a geometry schematically like this. Th this long uh, neck is trying to represent the fact that it takes longer to go through the wormhole than through the ambient space. In other words, if we send the light signal uh, through the outside uh, and one through the inside, the one through the outside will reach this other region faster than the one that uh, went through the wormhole. And this geometry has a non-trivial space-time topology and it requires some quantum effects. So again, uh, it requires some quantum effects generating negative energy here. Um, and those quantum effects don't violate the, 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 the icronal average null energy condition because this yellow light ray is not the fastest light ray in the geometry. So the fastest one is the, the green one and the green one will obey the average null energy condition. But uh, the integral of the null energy through the yellow uh, light ray could in principle be negative. So, and indeed there are some configurations where it's negative. So these are some curious and interesting uh, solutions. They're just a curiosity. Um, and I will discuss them now a little bit. So just uh, discuss how they are constructed. Um, so they are uh, time independent. They have no horizon. They, I should emphasize, they do not allow faster than light travel, as we just saw. So um, now one curiosity is that the uh, observer proper time through the wormhole can be shorter than the outside travel time. So for the observer going through the wormhole, it can feel like a short travel time. Um, but that's perfectly fine. Um, and the constructions we discussed require special matter, special kind of matter, but it's still matter uh, obeying the rules of quantum field theory. In particular, we do not require exotic matter. And so we'll discuss a simple example. Um, and so this discussion uh, will be perhaps a little more technical. I, I'll give a little more details. Uh, so bear with me if uh, you don't follow all the details uh, the talk will become easier later. Um, so the theory we consider is a theory of general relativity and the matter consists of a U1 gauge field. So like uh, so similar to electromagnetism and uh, massless charge fermions, so similar to the matter we have in nature, except that massless. Now it could be, this could be the, some of the fields of the standard model, but at very short distances where we can neglect the mass of all the fermions. So if we are at distances smaller than the electroweak scale, we can neglect the masses of all the fermions. And then the U1 could be the U1 of the uh, standard model or the weak hypercharge. Um, now, in order to construct the solution, we start first considering the solution for a near extremal magnetically charged black hole. Um, so black holes can have magnetic charge. And uh, so this is magnetic monopole charge. Um, in principle, uh, this is allowed if the gauge group is uh, compact. Uh, this is a relatively mild assumption. And um, such charged black holes have a limit on their masses. So their masses should be bigger than certain quantity proportional to the charge. And when you approach this limit, the black hole geometry develops a very long throat, um, which has a specific geometry uh, constant Two of, two of the dimensions form a two sphere of almost constant radius, and the other two form a constant, constant negative curvature space, which is the Lorentzian analog of hyperbolic space, two dimensional hyperbolic space, sometimes called anti two dimensional anti sitter space. So this is the geometry of the throat here, and then there is some horizon here, deep at the bottom of the geometry. Now, the idea is to consider a pair of uh, black holes, one with positive charge and one with negative charge. And then uh, we connect uh, the two throats so that uh, before we, we get to the horizon, we connect the two throats. So now there is no horizon. Uh, so this is just some ansatz for the geometry. We are not obeying Einstein's equations yet. And this connection requires only a, a small deformation of the geometry. And there is one free parameter at this point, which is the total length of the wormhole. Now uh, we consider the matter, this uh, fermion fields. and 
Something that is interesting is that each of the fermion fields gives rise to Q two-dimensional massless fermions, where Q is the integer magnetic charge that we're taking to be very large so that we have uh, relatively, relatively big black holes. Um, and then uh, these fermions form Landau levels, and the lowest energy Landau level has uh, zero energy. Um, so there is an interesting cancellation between the orbital and magnetic moment contributions to the energy, and uh, they have zero energy. And then uh, these uh, fields are effectively massless, and they move essentially along two dimensions. The two dimensions they move along are the, the time direction, of course, and then the direction along the magnetic field lines. So along each magnetic field line, uh, there is essentially a massless field that is uh, moving. So it's somewhat similar to what happens with electrons in the magnetic field of the Earth that cause the auroras, et cetera, but, um, or charged particles in the, you know. Um, here we have a similar effect, except that uh, the, we are going to focus on the lowest uh, lambda levels. And, and so now, uh, these uh, fermions are moving essentially along a circle because their magnetic field lines go into the wormhole. Then they go out of the mouth of the wormhole and go into the other one through the ambient space here. So the, the fields outside this pair of uh, monopoles of, of charged particles, they look like a positive magnetic charge and a negative magnetic charge. So uh, it's like the field of a dipole, of a magnetic dipole. And the important point here is that these uh, particles move on a circle. And um, so therefore, uh, when you have a massless, well, or any particle moving in a circle, you have some Casimir energy that could be negative. And so the ground state energy of these fermions uh, will be negative and will be proportional to one over the length of the circle and proportional to the number of fermions. And then uh, you can include this energy in Einstein's equations and you fix this one parameter that was left unfixed. And it's basically an energy minimization problem. Uh, maybe I, well, there is some positive energy coming from the stresses in the geometry uh, that you generated when you connected the two throats. And then there is negative Casimir energy and balancing the two. Um, you, um, you get uh, what the length of wormhole is. And in the end of the day, you find that uh, the final solution is in a regime that you can trust uh, all the approximations that were made deriving it. And this solves the equations in the wormhole region. So, and then, uh, however, from the point of view of the outside, these two objects look like oppositely charged black holes, so they will attract each other. And in order to prevent them from falling into each other, you can make them orbit around each other. And this will give a long lived state because it will slowly decay by emitting uh, electromagnetic and gravitational radiation. So slowly they will start approaching each other and eventually will disappear. But that's a very long time scale compared to the time scale um, set by the distance between the two and the travel time between the two. Um, so, and, uh, and as I said, this, uh, this type of configurations uh, then are, uh, well, are possible solutions. Now the time it takes to go through the wormhole uh, is uh, as measured from the by the observer that remains outside is this quantity we call L. We don't need to remember exactly what it was, but what is important it is, is that it is much bigger than the, or bigger than the distance uh, that separates them. So it's, so the final, con the final construction uh, gives you a result which is consistent with, the, with special relativity. However, as seen by the observer traveling through the wormhole, this time is much less than L. So the observer could travel in, in a, the observer falling through the wormhole could um, travel for, during a time which looks very quick for, for that observer. And that's a combination of two things. One is that as uh, the observer is falling in, the wormhole is, is accelerated, he or she is accelerated at very uh, large velocities. And so that uh, introduces a time dilation effect. And also there is a gravitational potential or the formation of the time-like components of the metric, which also uh, gives you uh, an even bigger factor. Now, we have only argued that these are possible long-lived solutions. Uh, and I don't know of a simple way of producing these configurations if they were not initially present. So there are some curiosities. I'm not claiming that they uh, exist in our universe. Um, the only claim is that they are positive sol possible solutions of the, um, of the matter we know. So they're possible solutions using uh, 
uh, general relativity plus the standard model. But they are macroscopic because uh, we needed massless fermions, and for that, we need that we needed them to be very small. Um, now, let me give you a quick summary of the things that we, we've been discussing. So we discussed the uh, wormholes, and there were two kinds of wormholes. There are the non-traversable wormholes. These are relatively simple solutions, just the short, the usual black hole solution reinterpreted. And then we, on the other hand, we also have traversable wormholes, um, and of those, there are two kinds. Some uh, give you slower than light uh, uh, travel, so where you can, um, like the ones we were we were just discussing, um, and then we have also the ones which uh, which allow you to travel faster than light. These are the science fiction wormholes, and we argue that these are not possible within quantum mechanics and relativity. Um, these are these are possible, but they are more sophisticated solutions, which include quantum effects, such as the one we we just discussed. Um, um, so now, uh, just on, specifically just for fun, we'll do a science fiction exercise. Um, this will be just a parenthesis. Um, so we we will ask whether it would be possible for us to travel through wormholes in our own universe. As we discussed, the ones with standard model matter can only be microscopic, so we cannot uh, have those. And if we wanted to have a macroscopic one where we could travel through them, uh, we would need extra massless matter. So we can postulate the existence of an extra, let's say, dark sector involving um, extra matter. And uh, one, one possible idea is to uh, invoke the exis existence of an extra dimension, a fifth dimension, and that we have gravity and gauge field in the extra dimension. This type of models were introduced by Randall and Sundrum in the 90s um, with, uh, for other purposes. Um, but um, so if we take uh, such a model, it provides a certain kind of matter that allows uh, for traversable wormholes similar to the one we discussed uh, with the fermions, the massless fermions, um, but that could be big enough for us to travel through it. Uh, so, um, I mean, the, the only point here is that uh, we are really postulating the existence of some extra matter. This extra matter, we just chose it, chose it to be of this kind with the sole purpose of uh, easing our, of making it possible uh, for wormholes to exist. So it's only to make wormholes possible. I'm not claiming this matter, this type of matter is likely to exist, only that, it, uh, but I, I am claiming that it's not ruled out. So. It's not been proven not to exist, okay? Um, and that was one of the main claims of uh, this model. Um, now, once uh, you do this, you get some numbers, so you can find some concrete solutions and you get some numbers. And if we want, uh, if we want, if, if, if we want them so that we can actually travel through them, then the curvatures uh, cannot be too high, otherwise the tidal forces would destroy us. And that limits uh, the size of the mouth of the wormhole and the size of the two sphere uh, through this whole wormhole region uh, to be of the order of the size of the Earth. Okay, so a few thousand kilometers. Um, so that's necessary from the condition that the curvature does not kill us. And uh, the travel time, as seen from the outside, uh, the shortest we can make it is about twenty thousand years. And this is given the constraints uh, we have on the extra dimensions. So we said that the model involves uh, an extra dimension. And uh, if the extra dimension, the constraint, the experimental constraints are of the order of 50 microns. So we make them as big as possible so as to enhance, uh, the make, yeah, making the extra dimension bigger enhances the effect, it turns out, and we make it as big as possible. But uh, we, um, the, yeah they are not big enough to give us a short travel time, we get still a very long travel time in human uh, years. Of course, compared to the age of the universe, it's a short time. Um, now, it turns out that the travel time as seen by the traveler, someone who goes through this configuration, is actually uh, less than a second. So uh, it's a huge time dilation effect. Uh, and this huge, uh, this huge time dilation effect results from a 
very rapid acceleration, very high velocity that an observer gets through the wormhole. And this creates many practical problems. So even though this is a possible solution, let's say in the vacuum, uh, in actual nature, uh, the cosmic microwave background entering from the other side would uh, fry us in the middle and it would actually not uh, be possible to, to, to actually do it in, in practice. Um, I mean, we, even, if, if, even if this one force existed, it wouldn't be possible to actually travel in practice. In addition, we have said that we don't have a simple formation mechanism, etc. But so I'm only pointing this out just to see, you, you could take this in uh, different ways. You could say, well, maybe it's possible. Uh, but I think one conclusion you can take is that within the laws of physics that we know, and with the present ty type of constraints on new types of matter. So we already have constraints on new types of matter that could exist. And taking them into account, it's very difficult to make a wormholes that could be traveled by a person. OK, uh, okay. so this was uh, the end of the science fiction exercise. So trying to attempt uh, a construction as realistic as possible for a uh, traversable wormhole. OK. but. Just trying to make contact with science fiction was not the uh, main reason why I'm telling you all this story about wormholes. The main reason is that there is an interesting connection between wormholes, black holes, and entanglement. And now black holes have been in the news recently, and we will be interested in their quantum aspects. So we know that they emit Hawking radiation, they have an entropy proportional to the area, and they obey the laws of thermodynamics. And this has suggested a certain hypothesis which is that a black hole uh, can be viewed as a quantum system. So if you take a black hole and you uh, are looking at it from the outside and you do experiments purely from the outside of the black hole, then the black hole can be replaced by a quantum system um, with a number of qubits or degrees of freedom uh, of order the area. And that quantum system is supposed to evolve uh, according to unitary evolution. So this is a hypothesis on how a full theory of quantum gravity should behave. Okay? Um, it says that essentially, if you consider black holes in the quantum version of general relativity, whatever that is, the final result uh, will be this one. Okay? And this hypothesis is supported by some results in string theory, which is a particular way of quantizing gravity um, from results of the entropy of supersymmetric black holes in the 90s or the connection of ads cft or holography that we talked about last time, and some other, some other considerations. Uh, but for now, uh, we will just take it as an assumption okay, about the full theory of quantum gravity. Um, now, um, now let's consider uh, this pair of black holes uh, that are connected through the interior. And the idea is that uh, so, such uh, geometry corresponds to a situation where we have the two black holes and their corresponding quantum systems have been entangled. They are in an entangled state. So the two black holes, instead of being in uh, any possible microstate they could be in, they are just in a particular entangled state, forming a pure state together. Okay? And they are, forming a part they are in a particular entangled state, which is the so-called thermophile double. Um, and if you have all the energy eigenstates of uh, one black hole, you entangle them or you sum them in this particular way where you correlate them exactly one energy eigenstate of one with the other energy eigenstate of the other, and you sum them all with a thermal looking factor. These particular types of states uh, have appeared in uh, some formal descriptions of uh, thermal system, and that's why, why they are called thermophile double. Um, OK, so this somehow relates the Einstein-Rosen bridge, which was the connection between the two black holes with the, with the property of entanglement that was uh, first discussed by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. So it's funny that these this people wrote the, the, their papers in 1935. Um, I wonder whether at the time they thought they, these two papers had any connection. Um, um, now. Just to explain a little bit more what it means for the two black holes to be connected in the interior, I usually tell a story. Sorry if you heard it before. Um, so it's the story of uh, two young people, let's call them Romeo and Juliet, who were in love and their families didn't want them to meet. 
Um, and uh, so they separated them and they put them in, let's say, separated galaxies. This is far in the future. Um, but Romeo and Juliet were very ingenious and they had very powerful quantum computers and they shared uh, entangled pairs. So they sent each other uh, qubits and they generated a massive amount of entanglement and they collapsed uh, their entangled pairs into black holes in, and they managed to manipulate them well enough to, so as to produce a pair of uh, entangled black holes. And then after they have done all that, uh, they uh, each were outside their own black holes and at the coordinated time, they decided to jump in and they went into the black hole. So their families thought that they had committed suicide by jumping into a black hole. On the other hand, um, uh, if we look at the diagram here, at the space-time diagram, when they were outside the black hole, they were at a relatively short distance through this Einstein-Rosen bridge because since they had produced entangled black holes, they um, generated a geometry which contained uh, this particular, which, which is of this particular form. And then uh, when they jumped in, they just met in the interior, um, but unfortunately they died in the singularity, okay? But they managed to meet in the interior. Now this, 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 this type of story did not end well, so, um, we could ask whether well, there is a better way they could have uh, managed to meet each other. And indeed there is a better way and it involves uh, quantum teleportation and uh, also a connection to traversable wormholes that was initially uh, discussed by Gao, Jefferies and Wall. Um, in fact, the, the fact that the traversable wormholes could be constructed using these quantum effects as uh, I discussed before was, were based on an initial paper that was written by Gao, Jeffries, and Wall. So let's uh, discuss uh, this connection. So first I will need to remind you about quantum teleportation. So quantum teleportation is a certain algorithm um, that uses entanglement to send qubit. To, so someone wants to send a qubit from Bob to Alice. And uh, so Charlie gives a qubit to Bob and then Bob sends the cubic to Alice. So one option is to just put the qubit in a doer and then send it all the way to Alice. And, but uh, the quantum teleportation protocol um, can manage to do this by first uh, Alice and Bob share some entangled pairs and, and then um, Bob realizes a certain operation and only sends classical information to Alice. Okay. And so it's a bit surprising you can send the qubit by using sending just a pair of bits of classical information, because naively you might think that in order to send the qubit, you send, need to send an infinite amount of classical information, which is the direction in which the qubit is pointing. So, um, so that's uh, what we want to do. And a central uh, element here in this, uh, this procedure is that we take the Charlie's qubit and uh, the, one of the members of the entangled pair and we mix them very thoroughly. So we mix them by a thorough unitary transformation. And then uh, we perform a measurement, a simple measurement. Let's say we measure the spin set component of each of the two qubits. And um, if this is done, and then after you do this, you, um, you send classic, this classic, two classical qubits to Alice. And Alice applies a certain operation that depends on the, the results of the measurement that acts on this qubit and produces the qubit that Charlie had initially, that Charlie had initially sent. Um, so this, I said this is, should be a thorough unitary. It should have the property that uh, it is not only a unitary as you view it, as you view time going in this direction, but for each given results of the measurement, it should also be a unitary viewed as time going from Charlie to this entangled qubit direction. And the one that Ali should use is precisely uh, that unitary or the inverse of that unitary we just discussed. Um, okay, so the resources needed to send the qubit are, well, we need to send two classical bits of information and we need to have one entangled uh, qubit. Now, one question is uh, the following. So imagine uh, that, well, of course here we had only one qubit, but we could imagine uh, sending many, many qubits if we have many, many entangled uh, pairs. Uh, but in any of these situations, uh, the requirement here is that 
this should be this very thorough unitary. And so one question is whether you would like to be teleported. So um, this uh, thorough unitary is basically like a blender that uh, mixes you very, very well with the mixes very well your qubits uh, and uh, this this members of entangled pair. So if uh, you are part of these qubits that are to be sent, it looks like it's somewhat unpleasant. So returning to our story, uh, Juliet, uh, well, and Romeo read this paper about quantum teleportation, and Juliet tried to convince Romeo to build a giant teleportation machine and suggested that he teleports himself to the location where she is. Um, now, Romeo is worried about this process because of this uh, blender effect that we just mentioned. Um, but uh, they then uh, read the paper by Gao, Jeffries, and Wall. And so Juliet uh, suggests using entangled black holes. So how, how would this be done using these ideas of Gao, Jeffries, and Wall? Well, um, as I said before, using the entangled pairs, uh, you, they could create uh, an entangled uh, pair of black holes. Um, but now um, we are going to do something slightly different. So, so we have one of the black holes here, says Bob, but this is the black hole on, let's say, Romeo's side, and this is the black hole on uh, Juliet's side. Um, and what is going to be done is the following. So Romeo will jump into the black hole at some very early time. So it will jump in into the black hole. So it's this, uh, this green line. So that's Romeo jumping, jumping into the black hole. Then he will arrange for uh, the quantum computer to do a measurement of the Hawking radiation of uh, this black hole at some later time. Um, so he'll collect some of that Hawking radiation, will do a measurement, and send the information uh, to the other black hole. Um, and then uh, Alice on this side, or the computer, will um, do uh, will use the information of what this Hawking radiation is doing which is entangled with the one here, and will manage to send the negative energy pulse into the black hole. So it is po only possible to send this negative energy pulse because uh, they know, um, so this one, because of, yeah, it's ex exploiting the entanglement between the left and the right side. Um, and this negative energy pulse uh, sort of produces the opposite of a time delay, a time advance that pulls uh, Romeo out of the black hole, okay? So then Romeo manages to go out of the black hole. And so the net effect of this, uh, of this, of what happens here is the same as what happens uh, if Romeo had teleported himself uh, with a giant uh, teleportation machine. Um, now the, the difference is that, um, is that when Juliet asks Romeo what he felt during this whole process, Romeo would say that he didn't feel anything strange in the process. It was basically like traveling through empty space. And if you make this uh, energy, negative energy shock wave uh, spherically symmetric, then he will not feel anything special when he suffers this uh, time advance. Mm -hmm. So this was uh, just a story, uh, just to illustrate some of the ideas. Um, but more concretely, um, there are some theoretical proposals for doing something analogous to to this for complex quantum systems. So it's really, um, it's not quite quantum. People have called this quantum gravity in the lab. And what it is, is you take quantum systems that um, behave uh, in a way that is somewhat similar to how these black holes are supposed to be behaving. So it's uh, tele so in the end of the day is some uh, teleportation. Um, it's a type of teleportation um, that uh, was inspired, it's a protocol for teleportation, a special protocol for teleportation that was inspired by these black hole discussions. Um, and this has been, it's been explored by, by various people. And so it's a, these are concrete experiments you can do. Um, and so the goal is to simplify that mechanism that is operating in the case of black holes and make it as simple as possible so that you can have something somewhat analogous that happens in, in the lab. So the lab is supposed to create quantum systems that have some of the properties that black holes are supposed to have. Um, now, let me return to the traversable wormholes that we discussed before, those um, ones that allow you to, to travel between the two sides. So we had this geometry that we have here in the right, 
the black holes are relatively, uh, well, they are at some distance. It's somewhat distant, but not too distant. So they have some interaction between them that is mediated by the bulk fields. So in this case, the fermion fields that existed. So we can think of that as two quantum systems. So one quantum system representing one black hole and another quantum system representing the other black hole with some interaction mediated by some massless fields that uh, propagate in the ambient space. In the case we discussed, the massless fields were fermions that were moving along uh, the field lines, the magnetic field lines between these two places. And they, they, those interactions create, uh, create entanglement in the sense that the, uh, the state with minimal energy will be an entangled state. It is somewhat similar to how the van der Waals interaction produces entanglement among the lowest energy levels of a pair of atoms or molecules. Uh, and so we could think of, um, of these interactions as selecting a particular state, in particular a state that is similar to the thermofield level state as the ground state of the pair of, of, the pair of systems. Uh, in conclusions, uh, one fault would allow you to travel in so the conclusions of this talk is that, first of all, wormholes that would allow you to travel faster than light um, would or travel back in time are forbidden. Uh, Non-traversable wormholes are simple solutions of general relativity and are closely connected to black holes. And they can be viewed as entangled states. Um, and also entanglement is uh, related to wormholes. Uh, so that we have called the uh, Dennis Saskin ER equal to EPR. And we think that it's actually a, principle, a more general principle that whenever there is entanglement, there is some, very, some kind of wormhole, perhaps very quantum mechanical. Um, we don't know where it holds in complete generality or not, but uh, that's the idea. Um, and then we discussed that when two black holes interact in the ambient space, they can lead to a traversable wormhole in some circumstances. And, but it's always one which is consistent with this faster than light travel band. And these ideas have inspired interest in experiments with many body systems. And uh, I should mention that similar wormholes play a role in the analysis of uh, the black hole information paradox. And we'll discuss that in the next lecture. So the next lecture will be about uh, the black hole information paradox and what uh, some of these ideas tell us about the black hole information paradox. OK, thank you. Great, thank you so much everyone for this great talk. Uh, so we have uh, time for a few questions. Um, so if you have a question, please raise your hand in the chat if, um, in the Zoom list if possible and I can call on you uh, and or you can also speak up. Let me see, are there any questions? Comments? So let me uh, uh, just ask one then uh, for um, a non technical question. Where do you see this work go next? What would be the next big questions uh, um, to address? Um, well, I think I think uh, the here the main theme was the well. Uh, I think what I consider to be more in most interesting is the connection between entanglement and space time geometry, and I think it's uh, we are learning how quantum gravity works and how uh, to identify the degrees of freedom of uh, the quantum degrees of freedom um, to a certain space time geometry. Um, so given a space-time geometry, we can somehow divide it into different regions and assign the quantum degrees of freedom to each of them. Um, I, will I will discuss more on this theme in the next talk. Uh, I think that's uh, probably the most interesting direction. Great. Thank you. I see uh, Walter has a I question. Think, yeah. Something I would like, where I would like this going is in into some application for cosmology. I, I don't I don't see it, but I, I would hope. Uh, Walter? Yeah, Juan. Um, yeah. I was hoping that you could maybe clarify this example you gave with the wormhole based on Randall Sundrum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you had an estimate at some point uh, of the tra 
transverse time, this 20,000 years yeah. number, based yeah. on the size of the extra dimension. But I, I got a little confused because my understanding was that this RS2 model that you were looking at is an infinite extra dimension. It, in yeah. fact, I understood that's why you needed because you, you wanted massless particles, right? So you want this sort of yeah, yeah. Particle. When I when I meant the size, that's the the radius of curvature of the of the extra dimension. But that is that not just the Planck scale, or I forget. I, it's been a long time since I think about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's um, yeah. And th those models, the the idea is the Planck scale is let's say the TV scale, and then there is some radius for the extra dimension. Yeah. So that's that's the if I remember right, that's the RS one model with. Two brains, two boundaries. And yeah, no, yeah. That yeah. has a mass cap, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So here, here we're considering the RS2 model, which uh, where the um, where there's there's no gap, basically. Yeah. So so let's say that's just the simplest version of this would be one where the 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 Planck scale uh, is let's say near TV it needs to be a little bigger than the TV, yes. but this type of scale. And then yeah. the, the size of the extra dimension is very large. Yeah. Uh, and, okay. And the, the radius, the radius of the ADS5 space. The, the curvature radius. The curvature radius is large. And that, that is what makes the, cos the Newton constant small. Uh, okay. I, okay. I think I understand uh, now. Yeah. I, I just want to say, by the way, that the, uh, the theorist in Interstellar also used a five dimensional black hole for, for, for her wormhole. Ah, okay. So anyway, no, but but the theory is the, the in interstellar the the there is a signal that travels from the black hole back in time. Yeah. So that's why I said that this is yeah a, fine. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Hello, may I ask a question? Yeah. Thank you for the good talk and the good examples. It was fun. Uh, I was wondering if you could explain what kind of properties a many body system needs to mimic a black hole in these kind of uh, experiments that are proposed. Yeah. Um, the, the main property is something that's called uh, fast scrambling. So um, the idea is that if you, if you modify one of the qubits in the system, that modification sort of spreads uh, relatively quickly to all the other qubits in the system. Um, so that's, uh, that, that's the basic property. It's related to chaos. So it's, it's, these are systems that are uh, maximally chaotic. Um, mm -hmm. And how many body the system should be? How many qubits do you need to make us well, an interesting uh, experiment? I don't know. Um, it, it depends more on the details. So how close you want the behavior to be. But I don't know. I would imagine a few hundreds. The, the experiments are being discussed now with the devices that they have now. They have tens of qubits. Um, but uh, they, they will just show some very basic things. Okay, thank you. I yeah. do have one more question, if I may. Yeah, it just depends. So your question, the answer to your question depends on how closely you want to uh, relate the two things. Um, yeah. And the system, and, and, and it's part, part of the things that these papers are doing is uh, identify the simplest uh, system and simplify it as much as possible by retaining as as much as possible of the space-time geometry. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I have an unrelated question, if I may. Yeah. I don't know if there is anybody else willing to instead, but I will just proceed. Please go ahead. Thanks. Um, so you said that if I have two big quantum computers that are sharing entanglement and I make them collapse, yeah. the yeah. two wormholes will not be independent. The two black holes will not be yeah. independent. They will connect yeah, they will with be entangled, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. They, they can be um, entangled. I mean, they you can design them this way yeah okay well uh, and the question would be as a function of what and i mean how much entanglement do i need to do this i mean if i, if I have uh, one yeah yeah the amount of entanglement you need is is proportional to the black hole entropy so to make a macroscopic black hole is hugely difficult mm -hmm. okay okay thank you very so much the, the 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 story of romeo and juliet is uh, you know very it's a sketchy story so yeah of course the, of course uh, but, but they, uh, I have like two different stars and they are sharing only one qubit that is entangled among the two. Yeah. And I do make them collapse independently. Yeah. 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 So there's going to be only one qubit of share entanglement. Yes. And yes, yes. Give you like a yeah, one. But then, 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 yeah, then you will not have a macroscopic uh, connection between them. You, you okay. But you will have a microscopic. 
yeah, a very microscopic connection. That, yeah. Okay, good. But that will not have a nice geometric description, uh, or at least a known geometric description. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay. I see we yeah. have one question in the chat. Uh, and it says, could you explain why would CMB fry us in the middle of a black hole if we travel through one from your traversable black hole example? Yeah, in, in that particular example, the as we're saying, the geometry is similar to these uh, throats that appear for near extremal black holes. And in those throats, if you send a particle from, from outside, as, as, it, as it goes in, it gets uh, blue shifted. So it's like falling into a gravitational potential, right? So the CMB photon acquires a very high energy as uh, it goes down. And if you enter through the other mouth of the wormhole, you meet the CMB photon at the center. And the CMB photon will look like it has a huge temperature. Uh, I, I forget exactly what the number is, but let's say um, a, a further, I don't know, bigger than TVs. So. Great, thanks. Any other questions? Well, if not, let's uh, thank Juan again for this very, uh, yeah, very clear and very interesting uh, talk. And uh, as he announced in his last slide, there will be another lecture next week where you can hear more about, yeah, the information paradox. Uh, so thanks again for the uh, talk today. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thanks, Juan. Bye bye. See you. Thanks. Bye. Yeah, thanks. Bye.